All right, in this problem, we're going to do a price control example um, uh, based on a Krugman Wells microeconomics textbook question from chapter five, which is the market strikes back question, chapter five, uh, question three. The question asks, in the late 18th century, the price of bread in New York City was controlled, uh, that is to say, set at a predetermined price above the market price. So part A, draw a diagram showing the effects of the policy, uh, and did the policy act as a price ceiling or a price floor? Uh, so let's turn to the um, regular demand and supply graph that we've been looking at before. First off, on the vertical axis, you have price, in this case the price of bread, uh, starting from a low price, going up to high price. On the horizontal axis, you have quantity of bread, um, starting from a low quantity, going to a high quantity. You have your typical demand curve that starts, that's a downward sloping demand curve. The downward sloping reflects that at very high prices of bread, there's the low quantity demanded, and at very low prices of bread, uh, more people will demand bread. Uh, and then similarly, you have an upward sloping supply curve showing that at low prices of bread, few suppliers are willing to supply much bread, and then at high prices of bread, uh, the supply of bread is going to be a lot more. Basically, there's more people willing to supply bread at higher prices. Okay, so how does our price control uh, affect this market? Um, without any price controls, we're saying that um, the equilibrium price is this P1, where quantity supply equals quantity demanded. Um, the equilibrium quantity is this Q1, which again is where quantity supply equals quantity demanded. What about adding in this price control? Uh, so we're told that uh, in the question that the price is set at a predetermined price above the market price. So we're going to add in some sort of new P value here. Uh, give me one second and I'll just add it all in for you. So I added in the price control. Uh, we're told that it's set at a price above the market price. So right here is the market price. Uh, so the price control is somewhere above it. We don't know exactly where. Um, at this price, you can see that the, the price hits the demand curve at some quantity that's lower than where it hits the supply curve. So we know that um, quantity demanded at that price is going to be less than quantity supplied. And then the difference between the two, so at this price, there's this higher quantity supplied than there is quantity demanded. So the difference between the two is a surplus. So more bread is going to be produced at this price than demanded, and the difference is going to be that extra bread, unsold bread, that's uh, somehow wasted. Um, and then in a sense, this is a price floor. I think technically a price floor is a minimum price that's allowed, uh, and it would remove all the rest of the market below it. Uh, so in, I think my, my typical understanding of what a price floor is, is it does something like this. Uh, my understanding of a price floor is that it takes, uh, so there's a minimum price and everything below it uh, is just not allowed in the market. So it's kind of saying like this part of the market is doesn't exist. So the only part of the market that's allowed to happen is the price above that price floor. Uh, this is a fixed price, so it's the only single price allowed. Um, so this price control is acting like a price floor, you know, it's creating a surplus and the other stuff we're going to talk about, um, but I don't think it's technically my understanding of what a price floor is, which is a minimum price. Okay, so up next uh, we're asked, Part B, what kind of inefficiencies were likely to have arisen when the controlled price of bread was above the marketplace? Explain in detail. Um, so, you know, the answer to this question, you could just take straight out of the textbook uh, Krugman Wells has a section, How Price Floor Causes Inefficiency, but I'm sure whichever textbook you're using has a similar section. Uh, and through it, it just kind of lists all the efficiencies that occur with the price floor. So the first one would be something like inefficiently low supply, uh, sorry, inefficiently low quantity. That is to say, uh, although this quantity of bread is, is going to be expected to be produced, uh, a lower quantity is actually demanded, um, implying that the difference, the surplus, is just this wasted bread, so inefficiently low quantity. Um, secondly, um, secondly, we would uh, talk about the inefficient allocation among of sales among sellers. So there's an inefficient allocation of sales among sellers. Um, so there's a higher quantity of sellers producing, willing to produce at this price. Uh, if the market were allowed to happen and the, there were no price control, we would expect this lower quantity 
of uh, sellers of this quantity of sales to be produced. This higher quantity, there are these extra sell or sellers who are willing to be to, to produce at that price. Uh, so normally, there's what we say is there's some inefficient sellers in this market. So there's some sellers who would have been put out of business due to inefficiencies that don't have to be put out of business because the market is set at this higher price. They're willing to to continue to produce. Um, so uh, that inefficiently reflects that the most efficient sellers are not the ones who are producing uh, all the sales in this market, and we would just consider that inefficiency. Um, next, we could talk about inefficiently high quantity, sorry, inefficiently high quality. Um, so you have all these sellers, and there's more sellers than buyers uh, at this price control. So sellers are going to seek alternate ways other than price to distinguish themselves. Uh, and one way that they could do that is by producing higher quality bread. Um, so, uh, and then, well, you might consider, well, that's not an actually an efficiency, you know, that we're getting higher quality bread in this market. Uh, but the idea is that at this price, there's this quantity uh, of people willing to demand um, that amount of bread. Uh, however, at that price, there's way more sellers. So those sellers, they by choosing to distinguish themselves on quality, they're going to be producing a higher quality than really these people demand in the first place. So it's a higher quality without a real need for that increased quality. So it's kind of an unwanted or undemanded increase in quantity, which is you know our inefficiency. Um, and then lastly, kind of obviously, um, given this price control, the government doesn't have a perfect ability to enforce prices. So by creating this, uh, you know, market manipulation by creating this price control in which quantity demanded is lower than quantity supplied, what we'd expect to see is a black market. So uh, these additional suppliers, you know, rather than allowing their bread to rot, you might expect these suppliers to say, uh, well, you know, okay, if I'm going to throw it away anyway, well, why don't I just sell it on this black market, this illegal market, um, which might have well, first of all, it's inefficient by our definition, and secondly, you know, might have un unintended consequences like the allowing for so criminal activity to flourish, or in allowing criminal activity to flourish more than it would without this price control. So those are the four or five you consider. So first off, there's inefficiently low quantity, which uh, leads to these kind of wasted resources, thrown away bread. There's an inefficient allocation of sales among sellers. Uh, which leads to firms that are relatively inefficient to be allowed to continue to produce in the market. Uh, we'd say there's inefficiently high quality. That is to say, firms are going to seek to distinguish themselves by producing at a higher quality, a uh, quality that isn't actually demanded. It's just a, an additional way for sellers to distinguish themselves. And then lastly, we would say that there's an inefficiency due to um, uh, this is creating an incentive for black market activity or illegal activity if you can't perfectly enforce it. Okay, so moving on to the next question, part C. Uh, it reads, one year uh, during this period, uh, a poor wheat harvest caused a leftward shift in the supply of bread and therefore an increase in its market price. New York bakers found that the controlled price of bread in New York was below the market price. Uh, so C, draw a diagram showing the effect of this price control on the market for bread during this one year period, uh, and then was it a price floor or a price ceiling? So a price... Uh, a shift, inward shift, leftward shift in the supply curve is going to look something like this. Uh, let me give me a few minutes to update everything. Okay, so that inward shift in the supply curve from S1 to S2 results in this new equilibrium price and quantity. Um, so you got new equilibrium price here at P2, which is higher than it was before, uh, and then the new equilibrium quantity Q2, which was lower than it was before. However, this question asks us to focus on the effect of this price control on this market. So draw a diagram showing the effect of the price control on the market for bread during this one-year period. Did the policy act as a price ceiling or price floor? So now the price uh, is below the, um, the, the equilibrium price, so our price control is P sub control, and it's below the new equilibrium price. So that is to say, if the market was allowed to uh, set its prices you know, naturally by the forces of supply and demand, we'd have this higher equilibrium price up here. However, at this lower price, which is uh, controlled by the government, you have quantity supplied less than quantity demanded. So supply is less than demand, and that's simply a shortage. And the shortage is exactly equal to the difference between 
quantity supplied, quantity demanded at this price. Um, and so this is going to act as a price ceiling. So as my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, but my understanding of what a price ceiling is, is a price ceiling is just a maximum price. So a price ceiling kind of closes off portion of the market and doesn't allow it to exist anymore. So price ceiling in this would be like this portion of the market up here is just simply not allowed to exist. And so the market is only down here. Um, and then you get all of the results that we'll talk about, you know, like the consequences of road price ceiling. Uh, I could be wrong, but we, so I'm just going to call this a price ceiling in quotations um, because it's acting as a price ceiling. It gets the consequences of a price ceiling here, but um, uh, whether it is a price ceiling or not. Okay, anyway, that's just kind of uh, mincing words or mincing definitions of it. Uh, so the, the simple answer is that you got quantity supplied here at that price is it's a lower quantity uh, that's supplied compared to the quantity demanded, the amount of demand that people would be willing to pay for at that price. Great. So la the last part of the question asks, what kinds of inefficiencies do you think occurred during this period? You know, this period where uh, the price control was set below the equilibrium price. Uh, so the first one is just pretty obvious. It's just an inefficient, um, inefficiently low quantity. Um, the, the list that I'm going through is in your textbook under a section labeled something like how a price ceiling causes inefficiency. So the first one is just pointing out the fact that quantity supplied is less than quantity demanded. So at this price, there's more people who are willing to demand it than uh, who are willing to produce it. So there's these people who are out there who are walking around the street saying, hey, I'm willing to buy this bread at this price, but they're not able to. There's no more bread. So it's that's the definition of a shortage. However, there's a few other efficiencies that are possible. Uh, so one is something that would have to do with the bread market. Uh, so you know the price control is fixed over some geographic area, whatever, wherever the city controls prices. However, outside that area, you know presumably there's some other kind of regime in place. Uh, so this kind of price control might imply that. Uh, the people who weren't able, the, the demanders over here, who weren't able to get the price in the city, to get the bread in the city, they're going to want to get their bread somewhere, and so they could go outside of the city to get it, which implies that they're spending this extra money, the travel, they're taking this extra time, uh, and that's just that introduces another inefficiency. Uh, thirdly, uh, there's an uh, what we call an inefficiency, inefficient allocation to consumers. So at this price, you have these people. Who are uh, um, so uh, you have inefficient allocation among consumers at this price. You have this quantity supplied. Uh, at that quantity supplied, there were this group of people that I'm pointing at here um, who are willing to pay a relatively high price, uh, implying that these people were willing to had a higher value on that bread. Um, however, this quantity supplied might go to any any consumers. Uh, so this inefficiency is what we're saying here is that the bread is going to people who value it potentially less um, than others. Uh, and in an efficient allocation, uh, we would say that the goods go to the group of the goods that are produced go to the people who demand it and value it the highest. Uh, in this setup, this quantity supplied here uh, could go to any of these demanders along the demand curve. Uh, it's not necessarily going to the people who demand it the most, or sorry, the people who uh, who uh, value it the most. So that's an inefficient the inefficient allocation to consumers. Um, next up, I think we're to the third efficiency, or maybe the fourth inefficiency um, with this this type of price ceiling, uh, would be inefficiently low quality. Um, given this setup, there's an incentive for the suppliers to reduce the quality of the bread that they produce. Since they know that at this relatively low price, uh, there's going to be, um, since at this relatively low price, there's going to be more than enough people to demand it. You know, the difference between quantity supplied and quantity demanded is that shortage. There's going to be more than enough people. They could reduce the quality of that bread uh, to allow them, you know, to say increase profitability, or there's no real reason for them to increase quality. Um, so it allows for this inefficiently low quality, or it allows an incentive for inefficiently low quality to occur. Um, and then lastly uh, is the black market inefficiency. At this low price, even though there's these all these other demanders willing to buy it, um, so that creates an incentive for this black market. You know, how, how effectively can the government uh, the city enforce the price control at piece of control. 
uh, there's going to be some market on the side that could occur where they're selling the, this bread at a higher price. And uh, with black markets, you have a potential for all of these other kind of negative side effects, you know, uh, additional crime. There's basically other inefficiencies that come with the existence of black markets. Um, and that's another inefficiency. I think that's the fifth one. Great. So this was price controls example, the New York bread price. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, thanks and have a good day. Bye.